It's a great pleasure and an honor to introduce our visitor, Milin Tambe, uh, today. Uh, I've known, uh, so first of all, to say uh, the uh, Milin's Tam, uh, bio is in the package, and it's an illustrious uh, biography. He's uh, won many awards. He's fellow of the uh, uh, AAAI and the ACM, and uh, won uh, several best paper awards, uh, mentored many students and postdocs. So th that's all documented in there. He, um, he received his PhD from Carnegie Mellon and immediately went to USC where he's been since his PhD. So, uh, But uh, Millen and I first met about 20 years ago. That's what we were trying to reconstruct. Uh, and it was in the context of a DARPA program called Control of Agent-Based Systems. And so uh, something that's not in his bio is something that I can vouch for is that... Uh, He's one of the most uh, uh, honorable, uh, uh, intelligent, and uh, uh, creative persons I've ever met. Uh, and we're lucky that uh, Milin's son is a freshman here. And so we're looking forward to maybe having several visits over the next three, four years from Milin. Uh, so any of you uh, students in particular who are interested in the things he's talking about might consider establishing contact with him that you could uh, pursue uh, when he comes back again. So, Lynn. Uh, thank you, George, for, uh, uh, for this uh, very kind introduction. And uh, thank you all for a very warm hospitality throughout the day here today. So I'm going to be talking about uh, AI for social good. And um, the basic uh, background here is that in the media, there's a lot of concern about the future of AI in terms of uh, loss of jobs that it may cause, loss of control and killer robots, moral and ethical concerns that may come about, but not enough of a focus on what AI can do for social good right now. And it is with this emphasis in mind that we established the USC Center for Artificial Intelligence in Society, a collaboration between our School of Engineering and AI and our School of Social Work. Our mission is to advance AI research driven by the grand challenges of the American Academy of Social Work and Social Welfare. Uh, there are 12 grand challenges. I've listed of six of them here. They include things like ending homelessness, achieving equal opportunity and justice, and so forth. The international version of this is, of course, the UN Sustainable Development Agenda, which also includes things like no poverty, uh, zero hunger, and things of that nature. Of course, these are big, big goals. What can we practically do at our centers? There's three areas that I'll emphasize today. One is uh, AI for assisting low-resource communities. A concrete example of a project we have is using AI for informing homeless youth about HIV risks and getting them tested for HIV, getting them to test for HIV. And so this is a project where we're working with the homeless shelters in LA, and I've shown that by harnessing social networks of these youth and running AI algorithms, we can be far more effective in spreading information about HIV compared to traditional methods. The result is not only more HIV testing, but also the smiling youth, and I'll come to that a little bit later on. But we have also got projects on using AI for substance abuse prevention, suicide prevention, matching homeless youth to homes, and preventing the spread of TB in India. A second area of our work is AI for conservation and protecting endangered wildlife. This is work going on with Uganda Wildlife Authority in Uganda. This is one concrete project. Our challenge here is if we can predict with machine learning where poachers are going to set traps and remove them before they trap animals, we can save endangered wildlife. We've been running this project for several years in Uganda and have been successful in getting snares removed and having poachers arrested. And I'll talk a little bit about that. Also, uh, in South Africa, we have uh, another NGO that we're collaborating with. They fly drones and take infrared videos, if we can automatically detect poachers and rangers and alert rangers when we see uh, poachers, then they can come and intercept these rangers. So we've delivered this software. It's being tested in South Africa. 
A third area of our work, which has been going on for a while, is AI for public safety and security. We have limited security resources and a large number of targets to protect. How do you schedule or plan or allocate our limited resources, taking into account a watchful adversary? We appeal to game theory, and by solving massive scale security games, we generate these schedules. Our work is in use by the TSA to assign air marshals to flights, by the Coast Guard to generate patrols in different ports and different police agencies. More recently, we've been applying this towards cybersecurity, and I'll come to that a little bit later on. Our colleagues and collaborators uh, in Israel uh, are using this uh, for monitoring traffic in Singapore for generating patrols in ports and in other countries. So what's common and the key takeaway theme in all of these areas is that we are trying to strategically intervene in the multi agent systems. We have limited resources, and we are trying to figure out how to allocate them in a uh, strategically useful fashion. For example, with low resource communities, they're trying to maximize the spread of influence by figuring out who are the key nodes that we can influence in this network. A key feature of our work is the fact that we're working in low resource domains where data is sparse and uncertain. And we are not only interested in running things in the lab, but actually doing interventions in the field. And as a result, often we get insights into new models and problems, as you will see with new models of influence spread. Same thing is true in public safety and security, where applying game theory has led to new models of security games, and in wildlife conservation, where we are trying to model our adversaries or poachers, and that's led to this idea of green security games. Um, all of this work is only possible because of our partnerships uh, with, in low resource communities. It's with homeless shelters in Los Angeles and Denver, with public safety and security, it's with partnerships, Coast Guard, TSA, and other law enforcement agencies. For wildlife conservation, it's partnerships with WWF, WCS, and other agencies. All of this also requires that we immerse ourselves in the field, whether it's with the homeless shelters, uh, patrolling in the forest in Malaysia, uh, being on the Coast Guard boats in New York, and so forth. All of this work uh, that I'll talk about is published. I'll talk about work that's published in the last three years in AMAS, Ichka, and AAAI, three major uh, AI conferences. There's also these books. Uh, the two, AI and social work, AI and conservation, will be coming out in 2018. If you go and buy these books, then from the royalties, I can take my PhD students out for a nice dinner. <laughs> so I hope, uh, I hope you take that as a hint. So. Uh, Let's start talking about low resource communities, and I'll introduce a short video uh, that showcases my PhD student who did this work and my collaborator and co-director of our center, Eric Rice. USC Center for Artificial Intelligence and Society, we are researching ways to leverage the power of social networks to address complex social problems. My colleagues and I have focused on one particular problem, how to use artificial intelligence techniques to prevent the spread of HIV amongst homeless youth. In Los Angeles County, homelessness has reached a crisis level, with nearly 47,000 people experiencing homelessness on any given night. Homelessness is and has to be our top priority. After all, real lives are on the line. Sometimes overlooked in this conversation is the increasing number of homeless youth. There are up to 6,000 homeless young people sleeping on the streets in Los Angeles. These homeless youth are 10 times more likely to be exposed to HIV due to high-risk activities such as unprotected sex and needle sharing. Among housed youth, less than one half of 1% have HIV. Yet among homeless youth, nearly 10% are infected. Educating all these youth about HIV is a necessity, but this goal is unachievable due to limited resources. So I'll explain how we use these uh, limited resources, but before I do, you know this, uh, we are close to Hollywood, so this was our attempt to uh, go Hollywood. So we created this video. Uh, when I showed it to my family, their response was, uh, this is not for you, please don't do this again. <laughs> but. Uh, Fortunately, we submitted this to AAAI, our main conference. The reviewers only looked at the technical content, not at our acting with all that walking and talking, and they gave us great reviews. So let's talk about what we are trying to do. We are trying to do influence maximization for the benefit of those who may not be aware. What we have is a social network, which is a graph G, an influence model R, and I'll explain what I mean by that in a minute. We are trying to choose K nodes, K youth for T time steps, so as to maximize influence information about HIV. Now, 
what is this influence model? Um, essentially, given a graph, supposing we have a node A, a homeless youth who knows about HIV testing, we're saying that there's a certain probability here, uh, 0.4, that node B will be influenced, will get to know about HIV testing. Then node B may influence node C with the same probability, and information will cascade in that fashion from node to node. So a challenge that we face in our domain that's traditionally not seen is that our networks are highly uncertain. These are obtained by social workers going to drop-in centers and noting down the social network of these youth. So what we have is we know for certain that node A is connected to node C, but we have dashed edges, uncertainty among certain other connections. So we don't know for sure if A is connected to B or not, C is connected to D or not, so those edges may not exist. Sec so in order to represent this, we are going to say in our graph there's going to be two kinds of edges, edges that we are certain about and edges that we are uncertain about. The certain edges we have, for example, here probability 0.4, information will propagate. Here, for the uncertain edges, there are two probabilities. Probability that the edge exists at all is 0.75. If it exists, then there's a propagation probability of 0.4. Now, I've noted down here exact numbers. Uh, in, the, in a later part of the talk, I'll talk about how to relax this assumption that we know these exact numbers. A second problem is we have adaptive selection. That is to say, we can't bring in all of the youth all at once. There's just not that capacity. So we'll bring in five youth in the social network at a time, and we'll select these five youth, and our social work colleagues then have a day of intervention where they'll educate them about HIV, how to communicate this information to their peers. And in return, these youth will educate us about their graph. So they'll say, well, I am friends with so-and-so. I don't know so-and-so. So we have more information about the graph. So now that we have more information about the network, we can be more clever in selecting the next five youth. We bring them in, we educate them, they educate us about the network and our understanding of the network evolves, so now we bring in the next five youth. In short, this is not a single shot decision problem. This is an NP hard problem, so in short, it will be exponential time to solve uh, for practical purposes. It's not adaptive submodular, meaning that standard off-the-shelf techniques don't give us the kinds of guarantees that we would achieve. So we need different new techniques to solve these problems. And we appeal to palm DPs. Now, uh, very informally, a palm DP is a way of generating a plan, a policy. Like if you're here and you wanted to go to uh, Los Angeles and you come up with a policy, you have to take into account the fact that maybe the bus from here to Boston may not reach there exactly in time. Security may take longer or shorter amount of time. You have to come up with a policy, a plan that allows you to take into account all these contingencies. So here, a homeless shelter needs a policy. You know, we are going to bring in five youth. They're going to give us some kind of information about the network. If they give us this kind of information, this is going to be our next step. If they give us this kind of information, this is going to be our next step. So we are going to generate this policy and give it to the homeless shelter. They're going to run it, bring in five youth. The youth are going to give us information about the graph. Then we generate the next five youth we want to bring in and so forth. Of course, to generate this policy, we need to create this policy using a PalmDP solver, a planner, an AI program that's going to generate this policy. Unfortunately for us, the problem space here is very, very large. Traditional AI algorithms to solve these PalmDPs don't apply. In fact, the largest we could solve for is about 30 nodes, even though the homeless youth networks that we have are at least 10 times that size. So in order to solve these problems, we use graph partitioning. So we are going to, and, and the reason this will work, is, I'll come to in a minute, is that we'll strike the original palm DP. We are going to partition the graph into smaller intermediate palm DPs. Even that doesn't quite work, uh, so we need to do some graph sampling. So essentially what we're saying is we take the original homeless youth network, and we realize that there are communities in this network, youth that hang out on the beach together, youth that play basketball together. And so there's fewer cross-community edges. We are going to ignore them and just solve for individual graphs independently. So each of these solutions is going to say, this is the youth I nominate. And then we're going to combine this and say, these are the total collection of youth that we want to bring in. Now, it turns out that even this intermediate palm DP, as I mentioned, is hard to solve. So you do some graph sampling. That means that one graph may look like this, where you ignore all the edges. One graph may look like this, where two edges are maintained and remaining are removed. 
and you solve these and then combine all of these solutions. So essentially, there's a partitioning and sampling method to solve these uh, PomDPs to generate the solutions we want. In simulations first, I'm going to show you these results for two homeless youth networks. One is Venice, one is Hollywood. We are trying to figure out how many non-peer leaders, those that we did not educate, got informed about HIV. And the green bars are our algorithms called Healer. The other three are standard other methods. For example, degree centrality, which is shown in gray, is bringing the most popular youth. This is the traditional approach that's used in these homeless youth centers. We can see that uh, the AI algorithms are far more effective in simulation, in spreading information about HIV to non-peer leaders, the ones that we did not bring in for education. OK, so this is good in simulation. I also mentioned that uh, we, wanted to fix, uh, we wanted to deal with the fact that we had assumed fixed probabilities of propagation and edge existence. We want to relax these assumptions. By the way, I'm showing in the corner the uh, PhD student, the lead PhD students who led this work. So this is uh, Brian Wilder's uh, PhD work. So instead of assuming exact numbers like 0.4 and 0.75, we're now going to say there's a range of values. So propagation probability might be between 0.4 and 0.8. We're not going to assume an exact value. Existence probability might be between you know, 0.6 and 0.9. We, don't, we are not going to assume exactly 0.75. So how can we solve for these problems? We solve these problems uh, by generating robust policies that essentially depend on solving a game. We are going to assume that we, uh, as our algorithm, want to solve for a good policy. Nature is going to, we are going to assume some sort of intentionality in nature. It's going to choose parameter values that cause us the most harm. So we are trying to come up with a policy that works against the worst that nature can bring on for us. And by solving this game, we can obtain robust policies. I'm not going to go into how these games get solved, but basically we have our algorithm trying to come up with policies and nature trying to choose parameters that cause our policies the most harm. And so it's, it's possible to solve these massive scale games using some iterative algorithms that I'm going to skip the details for. And we can show that, again, in simulation, uh, these um, Healer++, which is this... Uh, algorithm that solves for robust, uh, robustness using game theory uh, works better than one that does not assume uh, assumes point values. So this is all in simulation. How does this work in real life? So we recruited uh, three groups of youth. This is run at our, our homeless shelters in LA. Uh, about 60 youth under each condition, Healer and Healer++ plus plus are two AI algorithms, degree centrality is the traditional method. So the way this will work, we bring in, a pre we have a preliminary network, an initial understanding of our network. Healer will run and say, bring in these four youth for treatment. Then these youth will give us edge data, uh, saying, you know, these edges exist and these don't and so forth. So we have a, informed, a better understanding of the network. And then Healer will run again and say, bring in the next four youth. And again, they give us more information. And then Healer will run again and bring in the next four youth. So in total, we got 12 youth in this process. And so this would be repeated for Healer++ and also for degree centrality. The question is, are AI algorithms more effective in spreading information amongst the non-peer leaders, the, not the 12, but the remaining uh, youth in the network? And what we find here uh, are, these initial, uh, are these results. Healer and Healer++, about 70% of the youth got informed about HIV. With degree centrality, the traditional method, only 25% of the youth got informed about HIV. So the AI algorithms appear to be far more effective in spreading information. OK, they're far more effective in spreading information. Did they actually cause a behavior change? So we looked at how many people actually started testing for HIV. We can see that with the AI algorithms here, 40%, 25% of the youth who got informed started testing for HIV. With the degree centrality, the traditional method, nobody started testing for HIV. And in part, this is because the population here is small. But other con uh, in, we want to understand why this is happening. But AI algorithms seem to be more effective in getting information to be spread and for people to test for HIV. This obviously has uh, caused our collaborators to be really uh, very thrilled with these results. They've like Mary. This, this tech world with this social service world, like, and how we can 
we can kind of go deeper and impact young people and elevate them. If this group became a, a really big thing, it could really help out a lot of, of youth. So I talked about not only information being spread, but the smiling youth. And that's a very important outcome of this work. A secondary effect that we did not understand is that the youth that were getting selected by these AI algorithms were not the most popular youth. They were at the edges of the network. And by empowering them, there was some sort of a sense of confidence. And as a result, um, there was an increase in their self-esteem. What this meant in practice is that they were able to get better jobs, uh, stable jobs. They were able to maintain their housing and overall an improvement uh, in their life. And so this is something uh, that we are thrilled with as a side effect and, again, uh, some, uh, something that we want to investigate further. But let's now come to why were the AI algorithms more effective. So last summer, we wanted to look at the data and try to understand why are the AI algorithms being more effective in spreading information. And our hope was that we would be able to show that the AI algorithms are able to lead to better information cascades compared to the traditional method. So we sat down, uh, we had a student sit down at the data, and she came back and said, this is just not what is happening in these networks. There's no information cascade. There's nothing like it going on. And so why is that? Because uh, in these networks, they're often isolates, people who are not connected to anybody, or dyads and triads, people who are completely disconnected from the rest of the network. And who, is, who are the people who are most informed? So if we assume that this is our peer leader, we would expect these nodes to be not informed at all because they're not connected to the peer leader. But in actual data, it's actually these isolates who were the most informed about HIV. The neighbors of this node, not so much. And so in fact, in, all, in our three experiments, in experiment one, 100% of the isolates were informed. In experiment two, about 80%. In experiment three, 30%. But none of them should have gotten any information from the peer leaders. So why was this happening? If you look at trying to match the data with the ROC curves, we find that the prediction of independent cascade model and linear threshold model, both depending on some sort of neighborhood effects, is worse than random in terms of predicting who would be informed about HIV. So clearly, these existing models are not able to explain what was going on. So we've come up with a newer model that we call the activation jump model. The basic idea is that we are recruiting a team of peer leaders. And these are the peer leaders who we inform. They get excited, and they go and talk to a lot of other people. They're the only ones spreading information. So my uh, colleague collaborator, Eric Rice, thinks of this as a breakfast club. You bring in a diverse community. You, they get activated. And then they go and talk to other people. If the team is homogenous, then they are not as activated, and they are not going to go spread that information. And so if we use this activation jump model, uh, its predictions are far more accurate compared to these traditional models. So you can see the AUC here is 0.77 as opposed to these other ones. And in terms of what our algorithms were doing was actually in line with what the, A, what the activation jump model wanted. It wanted people to be recruited from diverse communities for heterogeneity. And that's exactly what the healer algorithm was doing recruiting people from different communities. And in a sense, it was automatically fulfilling, accidentally so perhaps, the need of the activation jump model by recruiting people from diverse communities. Now, we've tried to submit this paper twice to AI conferences, saying this is what's going on and not the ICM or LTM. One review usually says, great, awesome, awesome. And the other review usually says, horrible research. Your input data must be wrong, because the model cannot be incorrect. So we shall see how this uh, proceeds further. There's actually a mathematical model. I will skip all these uh, details. And I'll start talking about the next steps. So next steps here are uh, we are, going, we are studying uh, with nine, conducting this study with 900 youth in LA and hope to show that these AI algorithms are effective even in this larger scale study. Uh, without the AI algorithm, that part of the study has been completed. And we are now in the phase of uh, working with these AI algorithms. Some other projects that are ongoing, looking at gang violence prevention in LA. So we, are actually, we have actually given gang members these phones, smartphones, to play Prisoner's Dilemma on. Uh, and they're playing these games. 
and we're trying to note down what choices they make so that we can understand, uh, based on the pattern of play, something about where violence erupts, and perhaps that would allow us to uh, reduce the violence. Another thing is substance abuse prevention. So this is work that's being done with Urban Peak, a uh, homeless a drop-in center in Denver. So essentially, the way these programs work is that you have a youth home uh, network. The red ones are ones who may be addicts. So the basic idea is to cut these networks and add more links so that you create support groups. When humans create these groups, unfortunately, they'll create groups that will cause some of the basic idea is you're trying to influence people who are users to become non-users. When cre humans create these groups, they'll create these groups in a wrong way so that actually non-users become users. And so this is called deviancy training. And so AI algorithms can be more smart about how to cut these links and how to add new links so you avoid deviancy training. And so this is something that uh, we are conducting. This, uh, this work has also started. Uh, trying to prevent TB deaths in India. So the basic idea is how to plan outreach campaigns if a limited resources. And again, this is a multi-agent systems model that we have been working on. And this is work that uh, we are trying to do with IIT Guwahati in India. And this is something we'll be going to India to uh, continue this work in practice in the field. So let me now switch to uh, public safety and security as the second area of work. And I'll, this will be a short section. And then I'll uh, end with a section on wildlife conservation. So uh, this is work that began in 2007. This is at our LAX airport. Um, the basic problem is that there are eight inbound roads into the airport, not enough officers to put up checkpoints on all roads at all times, eight uh, terminals, not enough dogs. Where and when do you set up checkpoints? Where and when do you do canine patrols? We solved this problem using a Stackelberg game model that I'll introduce. And the police started using it in 2007. It was operational for 10 years. And so they would set up these checkpoints. Sometimes uh, these checkpoints would lead to arrests of uh, people carrying a large number of weapons into the airport. And uh, that's why this uh, work uh, continued at the airport. So the way this is done is uh, underlying it is a security game model. It's a game that is played on targets. So in this case, the two terminals are two targets. If there's eight, there's more, more targets. So if the police are at a terminal and the adversary attacks it, the police get a positive reward, the adversary gets a negative reward. If the police are at terminal one and the adversary attacks terminal two, the adversary gets a positive reward, the police get a negative reward. The solution to this game, as in a game of rock, paper, and scissors, is for the police to randomize their actions. So they shouldn't, if they're always at terminal one, a watchful adversary would obviously attack terminal two. So if they're here 60% and they're 40%, all the adversary who conducts surveillance knows tomorrow is that there's a 60% you know, chance that the police will be here at Terminal 1. But what they'll exactly do tomorrow remains unpredictable. The goal here um, is to increase the cost and uncertainty to an adversary in coming up with a plan of attack. It's not to provide 100% security. These kinds of games are called Stackelberg games because the defenders act first. What they do is it can be seen by the adversary, and then the adversary reacts. Of course, these small games you can solve by hand. When you have trillions of possible defender strategies, large numbers of targets to attack, solving these games by hand becomes difficult. And that is where our techniques come in. And that's how we solve the game for the LAX airport. So basically, we start with a game. There's a mixed integer program that generates a probability distribution. For example, this one says, send a K9 patrol at 8 a.m. at terminals 2, 5, and 6 with a probability of 0.17. Send a K9 patrol at the terminals 3, 5, and 7 with a probability of 0.33. And then we sample from this distribution to generate an actual schedule. So send team 1 to terminal 2 at 8 a.m., team 3 to terminal 5, team 5 to terminal 6. At 9 a.m., do something different, and so on and so on. So this is the way the police actually get the schedule, and then they'll execute the schedule. There's a mixed integer program that is used to generate the uh, probability distribution. I'll skip uh, this detail due to lack of time. So this program was used, as I said, uh, started getting used at LX in 2007. When news spread, we got a call from the TSA to visit their Freedom Center. And so right at the entrance to the Freedom Center is um, a memorial to 9-11 victims. So there's rubble from the Pentagon, pieces of the plane that crashed into the towers. Uh, part of the World Trade Center. And so 
as we were at the entrance, we were saying, whatever, you know, we are really inspired. We really want to figure out how to solve these problems that they posed for us. So they said, okay, how do you assign air marshals to flights? Uh, this is international sector alone. There's thousand, at least 1,000 flights a day. There's 3,000. And so if you look at the size of the problem, the number of strategies is 10 to the power 41 at the least. If you just feed the problem into armor, it will quietly die running out of memory. So we needed a different approach. So the way these problems get solved is by generating, an incre generating these strategies incrementally. You start with a small part of the game, and there's sort of a way of incrementally solving this game so that you never actually generate the full game matrix and yet obtain an optimal solution. And so that's what's been done. That's, what, uh, that's what's assigning air marshals to flights. If you've been on a US air carrier for an international flight, whether there was an air marshal on your flight or not, may have been determined by this program. So in fact, there's now uh, the security game applications that are used in different uh, applications by the Coast Guard, for example, as I mentioned, and in different parts of the world, as I mentioned earlier. There have been congressional subcommittee hearings. I'll skip some of these uh, details here. But uh, for example, here uh, from the airport officials, from the TSA, and from the Coast Guard. We're working with the University of Southern California to uh, utilize game theory as a way of optimizing and scheduling our patrol it makes it harder for somebody to anticipate where the patrols will be. So there's three areas of future work. One uh, is uh, working with the TSA. Today, if you go to the airport, there are two categories of passengers, TSA pre, and those for the rest of us, we go through a single channel. Uh, and what the TSA has been thinking about is trying to create more risk levels, and by looking at the flight and the risk level, give different kinds of levels of scrutiny to each passenger. But this, again, becomes a game that needs to be solved, and so we've, uh, we've been trying to solve these kinds of games uh, for the TSA. If you go to the airport and you stand in a long line, not our fault yet. Uh, we aren't solving these games. Uh, then uh, They aren't in implemented yet. Another one is... Um, is applying this to our cybersecurity. So this is a MURI project that I'm leading uh, with uh, several other universities, applying game theory towards the security games towards cybersecurity. A third prong is a, a startup company led by my uh, two PhD students called Avata Intelligence that's trying to apply these techniques in practice. So let me now turn to the third area that I wanted to discuss here, which is wildlife conservation. So I'll use this example from Uganda. This is Murchison Falls National Park in Uganda. Uh, some of you may have been there, but if, no, uh, if not, I highly recommend it. It's a wonderful park, really absolutely beautiful animals, but uh, there's threats to wildlife. Uh, there's these snares, thousands of them, that get placed in order to trap these animals. So to assist rangers worldwide, we've been developing this program called PAWS, Protection Assistant for Wildlife Security. Basically, how can we assist these rangers to, to protect these large park areas? There's two parts to the problem. First, how to generate randomized patrols. The second is to learn adversary models to target these patrols more intelligently. In service of this project, we get to travel to places that normally I wouldn't go to, uh, whether it's in, this is a patrol boat in Bangladesh uh, at the Global Tiger Conference. We patrol with the rangers in Indonesia with the World Wildlife Fund. I'll start by talking about generating randomized patrols. So the way we do this is that we take a park area and divide them into thousands of grid squares. And so here, each is one kilometer by one kilometer grid square where there's water, it's high value target because animals go there, where there's no water, low value target. And then we can use our game theoretic methods that I'd introduced in order to generate randomized patrols uh, through this park area. But Patrollers execute patrols when the poachers attack targets. We learn from the crime data to improve our patrols. So we generated patrols in this fashion. So I'm going to first focus on just this game theory to calculate randomized patrols. So we generated these patrols. We sent them to our collaborators in Uganda and Malaysia. Here, for example, a poacher's camp has been found by Panthera, our collaborators in Malaysia, in this Tamennagara part of Malaysia. So one feedback we got is that you're not paying attention to geography. And so we would be in Skype calls. We, will, we are in LA. Our collaborators are in Malaysia. Uh, and they're saying the shortest distance between two points is not a straight line. 
And uh, confused by this, we decided to fly ourselves to Malaysia. So this is me, uh, uh, my PhD student and a postdoc. You can see how happy we are. Uh, we're getting to patrol in Malaysia in a forest. And we started patrolling, hacking through the forest, finding a poacher's camp. And that's at the end of the day, completely exhausted. And the guide is saying, you still have to walk a kilometer that way. But in the process, we understood that the shortest distance between two points is really not a straight line. Uh, you have to walk along water uh, bodies. You have to walk along ridge lines to conserve energy. If you just walk in straight lines, you can go up and down and so forth and lose energy. And so there's a hidden street map that needs to be taken into account. And that's what we did. Uh, this is a preliminary evaluation of pause to say that it was more effective in finding signs of human activity compared to traditional methods. But this is uh, the first part of pause. The second part uh, is really about learning from poaching activities. And so here our goal is to predict where poachers will attack. So we have uh, this Queen Elizabeth National Park. They're trying to predict the likelihood of attack on one kilometer grid squares. So we have a lot of information about where rangers patrolled, uh, animal density, distance to roads and rivers, and so forth. And we're saying, how likely is it that the, rangers, uh, the poachers are going to attack this target by placing snares here? So there's um, a method that we use, which is a combination of decision tree ensembles and uh, behavior models uh, that allow us to pinpoint where these uh, snares may be set. I will skip this and talk about the results uh, in the remaining time. So for example, here in simulation, we have data from 2003 to 2014. And we say, can we predict where poachers will place snares? In 2015, you can see that this is in simulation. Uh, we are able, our approach is better than SVMs and other traditional methods. And so this is, um, this is working quite well. But this is in simulation to convince Wildlife Conservation Society. They said, you got to do it in real life, in the park, in places we never patrolled before. So, Here's what we did. We chose two nine square kilometer areas where there are very infrequent patrols. And we said, here's, what you, here's where you got to patrol, and you're going to find stuff. And this was done one month ahead of a conference deadline. If we find stuff, there's a paper. If we don't find stuff, there is no paper. <laughs> and so here's, um, here's what we found. Here's the places we said you should patrol to find snares. You can see that they don't overlap these green dots where we ask for patrols are quite away from uh, the red dots where crimes were noted in the past. This is where snares were noted in the past. So basically, we are not telling them, go to the same place where you found snares last year. You're going to find more. This is a completely new area. You haven't patrolled here. You're going to find snares here. And this, this is how they patrol. So they'll go. In this case, uh, so they're being told, you know, you have to go to a certain location, this uh, particular grid square. And here, he found a snare. And so he's going to note down where he found the snare. And uh, that will allow our program to become uh, better in terms of being able to predict. So OK, so we started the test. First, we found signs of litter. That's promising. Poachers are active here. We found one active snare. That was good. Then the, po the rangers found a poached elephant with its tusks removed. So that's bad because we were too late for this elephant. But at least the algorithm was telling us to go in the right place. Poachers were active in this area. And you, you know, we are counting down to our conference deadline as well in the back of our minds. Um, the next thing was an elephant snare roll. So poachers were active in the area. They were killing elephants. We found an elephant. And now we found an elephant snare roll before it was deployed to kill the next set of elephants. We removed them. Hopefully, that has saved lives of some elephants. And same thing with the antelope snares that were removed. Our hit rate was higher than the historical average based hit rate. And we have other measures to show that this is more effective than their traditional approach. Now, one criticism of this was, well, uh, you know, if you just patrol in any area which was not patrolled before, you're going to find snares. So we uh, created 27 different areas where there's not much patrol before. Five of them were, uh, we've said you're going to find snares. 20, uh, 22, you're not going to find many snares. So now we're discriminating. We're saying some areas, high chance of finding a snare. Some areas, low chance of finding a snare. And uh, they went ahead and patrolled these areas. We are looking at catch per unit effort. Um, that is how many snares were caught per kilometer walk. And you can see that 
our, where we predicted high, there's 10 times more likelihood of catching a snare compared to where we predicted low. So we are, our method is discriminating. It's not just saying go to an area uh, where there's no patrols and you'll find more snares. An historical catch per unit effort is 0 0.04. So it's really being able to pinpoint where to find snares. So this uh, pause was uh, didn't, uh, noted by Triple E Spectrum as one of the top technologies of 2018 in their latest issue. So we are grateful for that. And we are now trying to integrate it with uh, SMART, which is a worldwide uh, a software that's used worldwide with, by these conservation agencies so that we can be active in different spots around the world. Another part of this effort also is uh, patrolling from the sky. So can we spot animals and uh, poachers automatically? So this is done using deep neural nets. And this is work that's been completed, and they are uh, uh, testing it in South Africa. There's many other applications uh, in terms of um, sol solving challenges uh, related to the environment, protecting forests, fisheries, uh, trying to reduce pollution, and so forth. So uh, I'll end here uh, with the last couple of uh, slides. So there's a, a lot of exciting next steps for our center. We have established a partnership with Microsoft in their AI for Earth. So uh, this has allowed us now. So we'll have uh, summer uh, fellowships in addition to Microsoft. There's uh, funding from other uh, foundations. So there's summer fellowships. If you're a PhD student, postdoc, or um, assistant professor, junior researcher, uh, you know, please consider applying for our summer fellows program. We have postdoctoral positions. Uh, we are testifying in front of, uh, uh, you know, in Sacramento at our state capital, uh, in front of the Little Hoover Commission about the work on AI for social good. Um, jobs training is one of uh, a newer projects that's going on. We are trying to work with the Gates Foundation in India, in the state of Bihar. Uh, so that's uh, something where our you know, number of faculty from our center and myself will be going to India next month uh, to try and push that work forward. So lots of, uh, lots of new uh, n projects and next steps. So that's it. Um, there's tremendous opportunities for AI to do social good. And uh, thank you for coming and listening to my presentation.